<laughs> so we're going to have a chat about um, how you all, how you started. So how you um, initially got into music as a kid. Um, so I know that you mentioned that you came from uh, Marseille originally. Is that right? Am I right in saying Yeah, that? that's right. Yeah. yeah, South of France. Yeah, South of France. Okay. So yeah, um, t t tell us about your journey. How how did it all begin as a kid? Um, well, I'll make it. I'll make it quick. <laughs> Condense the the last thirty years. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm from uh, the south of France and I was quite musical as a child. My parents were not in the music business, but my my dad played guitar just as a as a hobby. He always loved music and so he played guitar. And my mum was a very big opera fan, so she loved opera wow. and she was listening to opera a lot at home. Um, so from, I think, a very young age, uh, I started learning piano and taking lessons like classical piano. And then I moved on to classical guitar and I ended up doing, I think about 10 years of uh, classical guitar. Uh, okay. I did a bit of harp in the middle as well. Wow. Um, so quite quite a, um, a sort of a classical training um, in music, but I wasn't very, I wasn't very clued clued up on like the technical stuff so I wasn't I know some like producers you know you sort of hear their story they're like oh they were like recording stuff on cassettes and and yeah. you know they were very into that early on and I wasn't really so but I was listening to a lot of music and I was obviously playing um and then when when I sort of like became a teenager and I was you know it's sort of that time when you sort of wonder what you're gonna do you know as a job and what what would you like to do as a career and and I was always very into science so okay um I had a, a scientific sort of you know in high school and um so so I wanted to sort of keep that but also bring a bit of you know music into it and and never wanted to let music go yeah. and um so so I did a I did a physics degree <laughs> Um, so did like acoustics and f like a lot of okay. physics related stuff. And uh, during that degree, I did an internship in a studio in Marseille. Yeah. And I was like, I came into the studio and said, look, I don't know anything about recording. This is just, I'm really interested in this and I really want to see what you do. And, you know, my background is this. So I, you know, I can, I know how to measure the impulse response of a room, but wow. you know, I don't, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to record a guitar. Um, so, um, so he was like super nice and really interested in because he was self-taught. So, yeah, like kind of a bit the opposite. And so, so I stayed there. I think it was two or three months, and um, it was during the summer, and we were like having lunch outside, and I mean it was great <laughs> i had a lovely time <laughs> but um Amazing. but i but at the end of it i was like this is like the, this really opened my eyes on what recording is and what mixing is and what yeah. a, a sound engineer does and and i was like this is exactly what i want to do so after that i sort of looked into what sort of course i could do to learn more and I ended up doing a course in audio engineering in France as well. Okay. In in Brittany. Yeah. And and after the th three years, it was a three year course, and at the end, I had to do six months internships. So mm. I did uh, a few in Paris, and yep. and then I I had an, an I found an internship in a studio in London called Livingston Studios, quite a, quite a famous oh. sort of yeah, studio. Yeah, very. Right? In North London, yeah, in Wood Green, and um, there's a little anecdote about the interview is that uh, basically I was living in France because I was still studying, and they said, "Oh, we, we would like to have an interview with you for the internship," and I was like, "Okay." So, so I basically flew in with a couple of friends, and I said, "Well, let's make the most of it. Let's let's I'll go to the interview, and then we we'll just have a, a couple of days in London as a." as a little trip together um so so i went to the interview okay. and and to, so the the manager which was a lovely lovely guy called tim 
Yeah. And he asked me, so which, where about do you live in London? And I was like, I, I don't live in London. He was like, what do you mean? I said, I, um, I flew in from Brittany today. He was like, what? <laughs> so he was like, well, I don't need to really ask you more questions. I think you, you've got the, the, you've got the internship. So I was like, uh... okay, great. And then we ended up chatting and stuff still, but, um, so that was my first sort of step into the music industry here and uh the internship went really well and after when i finished they um i graduated and then they offered me a job as an assistant um yeah which i said which i said you know why not i don't have i don't have any other opportunities and i wasn't really in a hurry to go back to france so um so i stayed and then i started sort of building like contacts and building building skills and and then I found um another studio called State of the Art Studios um in okay. Richmond in London and it was a um, kind of boutique studio with a lot of vintage gear like old oh, uh TG EMI desk uh like Fairchild and like yeah. everything everything that you want and yeah, they, they so had cool. it and, and lovely microphones and um, and I, I ended up being their assistant and their engineer for five years. Um, wow. So so I was like the house, basically. I was still freelance, but I was the, the sort of house because it was such an um, intricate studio. I think you, you really needed, and the desk was, you know, it was not a common desk. So yeah. you, you really needed someone to know to know it, to, to be able to do sessions on it. And so, so I did a lot of stuff there. I worked obviously with London grammar there with Kasabian that you mentioned in yeah. on the, on the forum, um, with Noel Gallagher, Liam Gallagher, Pink Floyd. I mean, a lot, wow, okay. <laughs> a lot. Uh, Kylie Minogue. I mean, a lot, a lot of people, I probably forget half of it, but, um, so I did really, um, like build like a like my i think my reputation as an engineer uh, and an assistant there and yeah. i also uh had another in parallel i i had a job at rack studios um because i met an engineer you know and he was like, oh well, why don't you come you know to rack and yeah um and then so so for the i think i stayed at rack three years so yeah so i was again i started as an assistant and and then i was doing engineering sessions and i was doing string sessions and and again you know many many sam smith mary j blige you know uh, like very very big artists not not necessarily as an engineer probably more as an uh, as an assistant but still big sessions to be on and and a lot of things to do and learning the thing about Rack is they had their own sort of house engineers as well, very talented um, engineers, and I could you could really learn from them as well, which was which was really great. So so that so that was then, and then on one one day, a producer called Fraser T. Smith came to Rack to do a session. I think it was a yep. a drum recording, and uh, I was assisting on that session, and that went really well. And I think and his engineer contacted me a few days later to do sessions with him at his own studio in Fulham. Yeah. And so I did a few sessions as a freelancer and and it sort of went well and and he offered me a full time job, basically. Wow. Um so so, uh, so I was his engineer for the last five years. Yeah. Um of like full time engineer. So I um uh, I wasn't really working in other studios anymore. Yeah, and that's and that's when we sort of went working with, you know, Dave and Stormzy and Craig David, now Rogers, you know, like a lot, a lot of big artists as well. And he's he is a writer producer, so it was a very interesting switch for me because in commercial studio when you're freelance, you only see little bits of the record being done, you know, yeah. either if it's like drums or something, and you know people that were coming in for, you know, a fairly short amount of time to do something specifically there and then taking the project away. And with Fraser, I could see 
you know, projects starting from the writing and yeah. evolving into finished song and engineering and mixing it and sometimes mastering it as well. Um, so, yeah. so that yeah. was, yeah, that was a very, very, de I think, defining moment as well, meeting him for me yeah. um, to build. I think I went from being sort of an assistant and an engineer to a full time engineer and having that responsibility and, and also becoming a mixer as well. So yeah, quite a lot. So that, that was it. 15 minutes, <laughs> 30 years in, in 15 minutes. Maybe talk us through about the different roles from being an assistant to then kind of merging into doing the mixing stuff and the mastering stuff. So how? So t t tell us the different roles and what type of roles you were doing and what, what those roles look like. So, so basically I started in Livingston, I started as a runner. So as a runner, you, you don't have uh, any sort of technical responsibilities. You, you yeah. just get, get people, people's lunch, uh, tea and coffees, make sure the studio is sort of tidy. You know, it's just a sort of all around, you know, making sure everything runs smoothly, everyone's happy um, because it can be quite intense and quite time sensitive sometimes you know you have yeah. a lot of stuff to do in a short amount of time so you know run, runners are really like a helping hand if you need oh i need a mic clip can you just get me a mic clip you know like yeah. that that sort of thing as a as an assistant you you are you have a lot more technical responsibilities so the the sort of running well to me in a state of the arc anyway the running of the studio was on on my shoulder really, because, um, you know, as you know, when you start a session, you have to patch everything from scratch, nothing is patched in. So, yeah. so you sort of liaise with the engineer does, uh, that was, uh, some, some, someone that never, most of the time never worked in that studio. So, so mm. liaise with the engineer to sort of set up everything, test everything, make sure everything is working properly. Yeah. Um, so quite, quite a bit of, like technical responsibilities, but then also again making sure everyone's happy. If there's no runner, you you are in charge of you know making people teas and coffees, getting lunch, if you know things like that. And and as an assistant, I always um, run Pro Tools, which is not um, uh, how do you say it? it's not all, all, always the case. But yeah. Most of the time, it's the engineer who runs uh, Pro Tools, but. As an assistant, I always, I always wanted to be, I, I find it by doing that, I was always involved because I think once you've set up and everything, I didn't really want to be at the back of the room sitting on, and doing nothing. Yeah, so, so I wanted to run tools and sometimes we were doing tape sessions. So I was running tape. Um, so even though I didn't really get that much um, training on tape, but you know, you, usually it was with someone who did know how to to record on tape so okay. um i was like the sort of old i was the sort of old school and new school tape up with the tape cool. right there and then prototypes yeah. in front of me so that was really good i think really quick learning for me and then once i mm. sort of step into engineering when obviously you you are in charge of the sonics and and um and also the proto session and everything like Pro Tools was like not at all a big deal for me. I was, it was like doing it with it, my eyes closed in a, in a way. So, so it wasn't too much of a, too much of a shock. And yeah, it's just, and then yeah, from the transition from assisting to engineering that you, you're a lot more in charge of the Sonics and, and how the, yeah. the whole session goes and liaising with the producer and the artists. Um, you know, to make sure everyone's happy and that's the direction that they want to go. And um, so, yeah, so that's the, so the, the different roles. I, I don't, I don't really do much producing, so I'm not really a producer, but yeah. um, you know, you still, sometimes if there is no producer with you in the room, you sort of yeah. have to put that cap on a little bit yeah, um, exactly. to sort of lead a bit if, if needed. Yeah, I was watching um, an interview with you. Um, mm -hmm. It's on YouTube, and um, I know in the interview you mentioned about 
like you said about making people feel welcome and being hospitable and making them cups of tea and that side of things as well so it's like that's so cool that you know kind of just making people feel welcome and at home so i'm guessing like when you've got artists in and you're recording them you just want to help them get the right vibes and put them in the right place and get them in the right mindset is is that what's going through your minds when you're trying to support them in that way and you know kind of getting your runner to do their thing and support artists as well is that how it, how it works De- definitely i think i think there's a big um we we undervalue that aspect of our job i think it's not just about you know being quick on pro tools or or recording yeah. an, an immaculate guitar or yeah. drums or whatever i think it's there's a personal human aspect that it that's really important in understanding it goes with so many things from like you said making someone a cup of tea making sure they're eaten making yeah. sure they're not too cold and not too hot um you know making them into that right headspace that they feel relaxed they can trust you as well sometimes when imagine you sort of walking in into a room and there's an engineer producer maybe someone who makes beats um you know maybe a studio manager you know there's there's a lot of people and i think you know for artists sometimes it can be quite um you know a bit overwhelming and and i think it's yeah. it's 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 hard to be you, you know vulnerable and be able to to have emotions out of you when you don't really know people around you and you don't absolutely you know they, they don't know that i'm not going to take my phone out and film them or you know so there's always yeah. a bit of you know getting to know you getting to know um obviously no no engineer sh- like there's, there shouldn't be any of that sort of phone and and things but yeah. of, unfortunately that happens sometimes really? so i think so I think you know you have to make to to make people comfortable and show them that they can trust you and you're capable yeah. and and that comes with knowing what you're doing, but also be attentive to to you know how their body language, being attentive to you know how they respond when they go into the booth. You know if yeah. really they're struggling with their headphones or you know you know finding ways to make them like feeling really at ease and I think it's is the engineer's role and the producer's role and I think that's often I think maybe forgotten a little bit it's like well you just put yeah. your hands on do, do you do your thing and you know it doesn't really work that way so so I think being being hospitable is is very very important that's so good so so it's like with well, when you're kind of get obviously been hospitable, you know, you're kind of feeding the artists, you know, you're giving them drinks and all that side of things. And then how do you know that obviously you, you've then got to move into the I know you've got a very scientific background uh, with the with the stuff that you've done with acoustics. And we we're talking about that earlier off, off air. Um, but when when you are then in the zone with the artist, do you, does the artist pick the microphone when you're looking at? setting up the chain or do you think right i know which microphone to go for how, how does that process work it's um it varies sometimes uh artists they know which with experience they know which microphone sounds good on them so they yeah. they said to me i want to i want to record on that microphone yeah. so it's like you know because i've i've tried many and this is the one i like and this is the one that i think sounds the best so to you like great cool but if most of most of the time i would know um i would know which one like maybe we would do like a little test maybe test two yeah. um two different ones at the beginning if if they are open to it um and they usually are you know to yeah. just for me to hear if i never work with them just to hear which one sounds the best um and then and then just go for you know the one i think is best and usually stick stick to that when i know that that's that's a that's a good one then i just stick to it and then i used to recall settings i mean that's that, that's not a that's that's not groundbreaking i mean i used to recall yeah. things for for each artist and then so then when they would come back um you know everything would be like already set and and yeah. things so you know it would save it would save time and even 
even though they don't mind doing it, they, they don't really like spending too much time testing microphones. It's not, it's not no. fun for them. So, no. um, you know, but, but yeah, most of the time they're really, really open to it. And yeah. Absolutely. What about as well when you're, as I know that you're doing a lot of pop and um, hip hop and R&B stuff now. Um, so I know that you transitioned originally, you started off, as you said, doing the, the indie stuff like Noel Gallagher and Kasabian. So um, how, I suppose, I'm really fascinated by this. With the process, for example, I know you were doing assisting like with the indie stuff. Um, so let's say an indie band compared to an R&B or hip hop artist. I know that the R&B and hip hop artists and the pop artists will be looking maybe more at loops and beats and that side of things. Whereas an indie band, it's all about live instrumentation. So. I know that you're doing two completely different roles, but do you have two different parts of your brain that kind of kind of aims for each type of process that you're going to to approach? Or how does that work? Hmm. I um I never really thought about it that way, but okay. I think I think when when I was in in series and we're doing more like band band stuff, yeah, there was a bit there was a bit more time. I remember, especially with London Grammar, for example, there was a bit more time into experimenting. So, yeah. you know, getting a lot of like guitar amps set up and and putting a few mics on, and um, so there was a that that mindset. It was it's a different mindset, I think, for for them as well. It's it's a different yeah. um, like it's a different like the session doesn't doesn't go the same way i think with with them for example we would we would like set up a lot of stuff we would like maybe set up pianos and because obviously they were quite a piano and guitar yeah. led band so we would like set up pianos and all the pianos and a lot of guitar amps and experiment with stuff and you know like experiment with pedals and with sound and so cool. trying to find yeah. the, the right sound yeah um then and that would be maybe for a few days you know yeah. and and maybe we wouldn't record that much in one day yeah. um it was at that time i think it was a few years ago now where you had a bit more budget and a bit more time in studios and i think now it's getting yeah. like even shorter and shorter so but, but then when you when i worked with more like hip hop and obviously it's a different there, there isn't as much live instruments for a start yeah. so so it's finding creative ways to make stuff that's coming out of i don't know ableton or logic or fl yeah. to sound a bit more organic a bit more you know to give it that human feel and i think with it's interesting because with um with stormzy actually when when there was like writing going on basically the way fraser worked is that everything everything was rigged and ready to go like patched oh, up wow. and ready to go in the studio so okay. all the keyboards piano yeah. drum drum kit you know we had like um like pad uh drums as well so so there was a lot of stuff to play with and i think and also someone with a, maybe a like most of the time fraser on ableton just programming stuff but he would be like programming something that i would record in pro tools while he was doing it and so cool. yeah, and then yeah. you're like okay i'll oh, loop that i want to go on the piano so he would yeah. i would loop that for a bit he would play something on the piano that i would record over the top he's like okay maybe that little bit there this that's kind of cool for a verse that's cool yeah. for a chorus loop put that into a structure into a loop then he would like put some guitars on you know like he would sort of build build stuff like that quite quickly because yeah. I think it would there wouldn't be so much about oh let us maybe find that that play with like a loop pedal or loop delay or whatever it would be like just yeah. put ideas down quite quickly and to make it them sound good so so it's 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 a bit of a different sort of vibe I think in the studio but I I think the fund the 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 foundations of both as an engineer, yeah, they, they are kind of the, the same, you know, and and I'm really glad that I I had a, a sort of uh, the sort of traditional traditional training by being in the studio. So I, 
even yeah. though I've studied it before, but I, I learned how to record live instruments. And yeah. in Livingston, they were doing a lot of world music as well at the time. Oh, wow. So, okay. Because it That's was so owned cool. by uh, World Circuit. So yeah. um, a lot of world music. And so, so I did learn how to record stuff first and and then it's just when when i sort of transitioned with fraser that it was a lot more program based yeah if that makes sense yeah absolutely it does indeed so i well, when i was um looking at some of the stuff that you've you've done on a, an interview um mm -hmm. i know that as you said as you said that you had your pro tools rig and as you said i'm a right and that fraser had his ableton rig and then mm -hmm. how, how how did that what, did he basically kind of come up with stuff on Ableton or the creative stuff and then send it over to you to then process through Pro Tools? Is that how the how the session would work with that sort of setup? Well, most of the time we, we sort of experimented it a bit to find yeah. the right way to do to do stuff. But we we figured out that the most efficient way during the session, during the writing process, yeah. was just for me to get um, his output. So just yep. a stereo and put that into, into my Pro Tools session and track, like track a lot of stuff from on, on top of that stereo, maybe yeah. sometimes cut vocals, but then on, in the background, you know, either at the end of the day or like the, the, the day after or something, I would go into his Ableton, uh, Ableton session yeah. and root stuff out. So uh, he obviously had a lot of outboards and he had a, a, a console and everything in his studio. So I would just root stuff out and be like, okay, well, maybe I could put that 33609 on the keys yeah, yeah, yeah. or, you know. So so I was doing that and then just putting that together and doing a mix really of it. Because most of the time, you know, when, when he was in the vibe, you know, things maybe were a bit clipping or, you know, yeah. it's always like yeah, it's yeah. so on the fly all the time that – you know, it's not correct sort of level wise. So so I would sort of go in and just maybe pull stuff down if there was things clipping and and you know processing them and then everything was back into Pro Tools and then we would build on from from there. And then if you had if you wanted to redo some stuff, if you re reworked on, on the on the track later on, either I would do the same or I would just get the just a bounce of it and I would uh, maybe process it later into Pro Tools. It, it would depend, but um, yeah, that was basically the 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 vibe of it. But because he had so much keyboards uh, around and outboard and stuff, like everything was everything that was recorded in Pro Tools was processed yeah. by by something. Um, so it was kind of pre like there was a lot of mixing going on before the mixing stage and i think that was also something new to me that's the sort of mixing as you go yeah um mindset which i didn't really have before like okay. before it was like recording a lot of stuff and yeah. then maybe someone usually maybe the producer or maybe the artist later they would they would take the session back to their home studio or to another studio and they would you know sort through takes and things like that but mm. and then and then sort of mix but but then for me because i was you know on the project all the time yeah i could you know i was you know obviously comping all the all the stuff and 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 tuning when needed tuning so i was uh, and then mixing stuff as we go because fraser couldn't work on the track if he wasn't sounding you know if 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 we it would be like oh Let's let's worry about that. Let's mix it later. That wouldn't work for him. He wanted, you know, to make production decisions. He needed to yeah. hear it yeah. as a, you know, already sort of mixed product, which which a lot of people do now. But for me at the time, that was kind of a new way of working, if that makes sense. So good. So I'm guessing at that moment in time as well. How long ago was this then? How many? So many I started years ago? with. I was starting with it was five years ago. So it was in 2016. Okay. Um, so to that I think that leads us in really nicely as well. Then into the story with obviously I know that a couple of years before that you were working with London Grammar and then with Stormzy as well. But then uh, the MPG awards then started coming your way and. How did you feel? I know that obviously you love 
science and you love being in the studio mm -hmm. and you love acoustics and all that 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 side of things and then obviously kind of your journey but how did it feel to be in on the stage with Stormzy for example in 2018 to be in front of your peers and you know what what was that like you know I know that a lot of engineers it's all about the journey and continued journey but I know that when we talked to Steve last week about his Grammy um how did it feel just being up there just kind of in front of all your peers did, did it feel strange or did it feel amazing or well, what was it like that, that whole journey I think it's I think it's a bit of bit of both <laughs> it's yeah. a bit, bit strange and, and amazing at the same time yeah. no it's um it's really crazy because you know you never you never really e expect those things to happen to you yeah. and it, you know it was it was really overwhelming and mm. um you know that he came out as well to give me the the award oh, wow. um so yeah. Um, and I didn't know, obviously I didn't know. So, yeah. uh, so I was really surprised and really like humble that he, he took, the, because he's a busy, I mean, he's a busy man. Of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> that he took the time to, to come out and, and do a little speech. And yeah, it was that, that night was very like the both, both years, they were really, really special. And, um, yeah. I felt I felt really proud because you know you 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 don't obviously do what you do for the awards, but no, of course. Um, but you know we all work very hard, and sometimes when things like that come your way, then then it's, it's really it's a really nice feeling because yeah. you're like, well, you know, all that that hard work, you know, people are recognizing that you're working hard, and what you're doing is decent is not too bad yeah so <laughs> so so you know it's it's a it's it's a great feeling um uh i'm really proud of 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 having those and yeah and um and of what i've every, everything that i've done everything i've worked on because everything all all projects are special you know i've got memories of even when i was an assistant or you yeah. know that i didn't have I wasn't as involved maybe, but still part of the process because it's it's a whole team effort. It's not just, you know, one person is really, you know, to make records, it's it's a team. It's a it's a, a big number of people making stuff happen. Absolutely. Um, so so being recognized in within that team is is great. I looked up um some of your discography and I uh, looked up um, who worked on each song? For example, mm. I looked at one of the London grammar uh, one one of the London grammar songs, and I just saw mm. how many people, including yourself, how many people are actually involved just in one song. You know, it's yeah. it's, it's incredible. It's it's crazy because you know remember that you know nowadays songs like not everything is recorded at one place at this yeah. you know at one time anymore because bands they don't spend. A year in the studio mm. they they do a lot of little bits and bobs in different places so every time there's an engineer there's an assistant there's a producer and you know so so over the the whole album in like in one song maybe that song traveled you know a, a fair amount maybe it was started in america and then you know we we have the files here we work on it in in one studio then they took it somewhere else yeah. you know so there's there's a lot of there's there's always a lot of people involved yeah that's so so good i suppose that leads on to uh we'll talk about maybe gear a little bit in a moment um mm -hmm. maybe some of the plugins that you enjoy using um but any fun stories from the studio anything that you'd like to share with the people that you bumped into over the years with uh with all the artists oh <laughs> that's hard to <laughs> hard put you to... on the spot sorry <laughs> <laughs> should i have thought of that before um i mean all the time the, the, there are there are like anecdotes here and there but i think mm. most of the time i've i've been i've said it before that i've been really lucky in the people i've worked with i i don't know how that happened but like all the artists and there's, you've seen this there are a few people that i've worked with over the years and 
they've all been so lovely to me and I think Amazing. sometimes some more than others but yeah um but I've always been I've, I've always felt very accepted here yeah, um brilliant. which which I find amazing because you hear, especially now with Me Too and with a lot of things that are, you know, c coming out that people yeah. are not silent about anymore, which yeah. they shouldn't be silent about. Um, then, you know, you hear so many horror stories about studio and stuff. And, and for me, I always felt so at home and at ease in studios, even sometimes if I didn't speak much because it wasn't my role mm. to be at the forefront but but everyone was you know really nice to me and and really respectful and you know obviously sometimes you have you know uh things that get you know like working it's it's hard you know working super late and things like that but yeah but overall like very you know people really like grateful to be to be in the studio and stuff like that so so like a lot of a lot of positive um, memories, and I think it's important to put positive, uh, like memories, up front as well, because there's so much bad stuff going on. Absolutely, like to, yeah. To 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 see also that it can be, and I think now it's going to be an even more safe place yeah. for people, and especially for women as well, to okay. work to work in there, and and as artists or as technicians, so. Yeah. So yeah, and and I would say also to not be, to to not be afraid of it. I mean, I've I've worked most of the time. I was the only woman in the room, most yeah. most of my career, and and you you know I always felt like I had my place, um, yeah. and people respected that. And it's so so important, it's like you said. You know how you said that, which is amazing how you felt so supported by. Um, or the male engineers that you've worked with over the years and all the artists as well. But, you know, it's so, but however, it's very male dominated, the industry mm. at the minute. And we really at PMFC, at Produce, Mix, Fix and Conquer, we want to help Eve um, and help inspire more women to get involved and learn. You know, if, you know, there's female engineers and male engineers just like literally listening to your journey it's just so inspiring to know that there are people out there that, you know, that might have a laptop or a pair of headphones and start off from scratch with barely anything. And like you said, you know, when we talked off air, you said that you've got, which is amazing, really supportive parents that help you back home in France. And then, you know, where you are now, it's just, it's mind blowing. Absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. Um, so talk, talk us through um, the sort of gear that you're working with at the minute and the, the plugins that you like as well what, what sort of stuff do you use and what, what what are you enjoying at the minute so i so now that i'm mixing um i'm not doing much recording anymore but i'm mixing most of the time yep. i when i was working with fraser we, we were always doing a bit of uh, sort of hybrid so like i was saying i was printing a lot of stuff yep. through analog gear and then carried on mixing in the box um which i wanted to keep that way for the stuff that I'm doing now. So um, so basically in my studio, I've got um, a UTA uh, MPEQ1, which is undertone audio, Eric Valentine's um, gear that he created. Nice. Um, so that's like a, an amazing pre and EQ. And I, I EQ a lot of things. I, I got a sort of line in and I print EQ um, on stuff with that. I've got a tube tech, which is my favorite, I think, compressor. Um, you know, zero one B. It's it's just it just works on so many things and, and I yeah. love it on vocals and so so I usually run vocals through it as well. And and recently I've been I've been working um with the Mag DSP APB mixer. Okay. Uh, I, like an, it's an analog sort of processing box. And it's really great because it's uh, basically digitally controlled analog in, you know, and it's just a, a one new rack box. It's really, I think if, you, if you're if interested in that sort of hybrid mixing, you should sort of check it out and look into it because Definitely. it's, it's um, 
Like it, it really, I, I love the sound of it. And, and for me, because I work on a lot of projects at the same time, yeah. um, and I need to be able to do revisions very quickly, that for me, I would love to mix on the desk, don't get me wrong, but it's just physically not, not possible because of recalls yeah. and, you know, the time it would, you know, it would take. And so, so I think hybrid mixing is the, the best way to work for me. Um, and, and with that um, APB, um, that, that really like stepped on uh, my mixes, I think, for in, like in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so, so I really have been enjoying that. And plugin wise, I, I actually don't have that many plugins, surprisingly, okay. because I always, I always thought that, you know, with on rigs that I've been working on before, the list of plugins is endless, yeah. and, and I'm like, some for me, it is just overwhelming how many plugins there are available, and. Sure, absolutely true. And, and I'm like, you know, when before you had the, the now in Protos you have the search uh, function, which is great to find quickly something. But if you wanted yeah. to get put something on, you have to go through the whole list of things. And I was like, yeah, this yeah. is too, this is overwhelming for me. So yeah. basically over the years, I I know which plugins I like and I work well with. And yeah. so I, I just bought those. So I don't have massive amount of plugins, but like the plugins that I have, I use all the time. And when there's something new coming up, I'll demo it. And then if I like it, I'll buy it. But if not, I don't want to sort of buy so much stuff just to say that I have it because it doesn't yeah. make sense for me. Um, no. And uh, so what do I like? I, I love UAD, UAD stuff. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, what do I use? I use the the LA the, the LA two A is great. I love that compressor. Um, yeah, the compressor yeah, yeah. Uh, UAD. Yeah. Um, you know, not no surprise like fab filter stuff. I mean that that really works. I really do love fab fab filter EQ and the limiter the Pro L two. Yeah, Pro yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I've got a few waves um as well that I always like. I do use. Um, the Pro Tools Lo-Fi plugin a lot, yeah. uh, Little Radiator, Sound Toys. You know, I think yeah. it's 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 nothing, nothing that no one has ever you know heard of. Like everyone knows those plugins. Yeah. Um, I I use Valhalla stuff a lot. I really oh, do. Oh, that like was the, great. Yeah, the the, the, the the reverb and the delays Valhalla. Yeah, are they're so really good. they're really great. So yeah, you know, nothing and you know, just keeping my eyes my ears out on what's new like i've 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 um i bought the new cla i do love cla uh plugins that like chris or RG, all, all i think they're fantastic the cla vocals on so all, all my vocals yeah. um and he he launched a new one called cla Ep cla epic which yes. seems really cool so like yeah. that that's what does it for me it's like something interesting and i'm like oh Okay, but to me, having hundred different EQ doesn't doesn't really make sense for me. So um, no. it's when I find something that's kind of oh cool, that's that could be a cool thing to to play with. Then 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 I'll buy it. Um, yeah. So yeah. That, that, that <laughs> makes sense. What about like kind of uh, so you mentioned about plugins like DSs? Do you use outboard oh, yeah. DSing or do you use any what plot of plugins do you like for DSing? Um so I do like the the fab filter uh DS but yep. there's one that I've actually I was seeing some reviews um online I, I could see a pop up is the the Vice DS of I uh, is made by Soft Softube is modeled yeah. on the, on the awesome. analog yeah, yeah. version yeah. and it's it's fantastic as well it's really good yeah. so so bought that <laughs> amazing have you <laughs> It, it's it's such a cool plug. I've I've demoed it and it's fantastic. I completely it's really agree good, with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really good. Sorry, go ahead. So you're gonna say the the other one that I really like as well is the Vice. Um, I think it's called Ma Maximizer. Yeah, the um, it's sort of like a limiter. Is that yeah, right? Is that the that's yeah. that's a, that's amazing as well. Yeah. Vice is just such a good, such a good company. Uh, have you, um, before we carry on, have you tried out the um, 
Oak Sound Sooth 2. Have you given that a go yet? Yes. Or, yeah, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Did we quite impressed? Are we like, yeah. Yeah. I I'm, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it because I do think it's amazing, but sometimes maybe it's because I use it, I use too much of it so I can I can hear it and I it just takes away something for yeah. me. Yeah. So so I have to be careful with it. Yeah. Because you know, that sometimes you lose a bit of excitement that, you know, even though it's a bit more correct and yeah. you know, sometimes you want that a bit, you know, even if it's a bit spiky then it's it's okay it's yeah, okay yeah, yeah. depending on what what you're doing. Um I do love it on hi hats though. I use it on hi hats a lot. Too. Okay, cool. So are you um, very much engineer wise, are you very much less is more when 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 you're approaching mixing and mastering do you, do you feel that you sometimes you don't really need to use that many like you said you know you only use a few plugins or a few bits of outboard it's whatever color maybe suits the application definitely and i've been i think i've been guilty of using too much sometimes and when i send a mix and this and back and like you know it's not really and i go yeah. back and I, I i turn stuff off i'm like okay this this clearly wasn't the direction so yeah so to take things off and sometimes it's true that sometimes less is more but also sometimes what you've the chains that that you've curated and the chains that you like but they also do work so yeah, yeah it's really there's no there's no right and wrong isn't it so sometimes you nail it and sometimes you don't um yeah and, absolutely <laughs> And you know, sometimes it's mix one, sometimes it's mix thirty. You know, that's yeah, hundred <laughs> percent, absolutely. And I, I suppose it's so good to know. It's obviously as I'm just an amateur and kind of you know transitioning, hopefully into intermediate. Um, but it's so good to know that kind of everyone kind of has the similar thing where you know they, they their artist gets in contact with them and goes try again. And you know, but mm. I'm, gu I'm guessing that's. That's how we learn. I know that Daryl Thorpe, who's on the community, I know that his stance is very much you're a forever student of music. So you're constantly evolving and constantly learning. Um, what I'm interested as well, um, before we before we finish in a, in a few minutes, is um, mastering as well. I know that you do some mastering. So mm -hmm. do you have any, um, how do you approach mastering? Are you, do, do you have a separate outboard chain or a separate hybrid chain? How, how do you go for it? Um, well, it's the, the thing is with mastering for me is that al although I do think it's a it's a step in in it in its entirety, but by I think in the recent years we had to put some kind of mastering onto mixes onto onto production mixes yeah. to you know is that that discussion is endless isn't it. Is that, Absolutely. You know, when yeah. you send when you send a track, um, like a, a production mix, that that will people that are listening to it decide if the the track is making the album or not, or if if it's getting picked by the artist or not. Yeah. Um, you have to put some sort of mastering on it, and I think just put a limit on it is not. I, I don't think it's good enough. So so yeah. you you have to develop a way of you know making your reference mixes or prog mixes sound really good and then as a mixer when you send mixes for approval mm. you you can't send them at as at a mix level you have to send them at a master level so yeah. but then again it's not just level it's also you know you sort of preempting what mastering is going to do yeah Absolutely. So, so, so I've been sort of do, been doing that for the last few years by necessity, in a way, because yeah. you had to do that to be to be able to send stuff. Um, but then now, I'll see it. I, I try sometimes to get other people to master my mixes because I always think it's best to have someone else. Yeah. Sort of fresh ears listening to what you've done, because yeah. at at one point you can't you don't know anymore. I mean, I find that, you know, I, I really like having someone else sort of take that, that over. Yeah. But at the same time, sometimes I get stuff back and I'm like, this is not, 
really how I hear it. And so so there's that that sort of hard sort of in the middle place where what do you do? Do you still yeah. send stuff out to other people or do you Absolutely. do it yourself? Because you have that vision and you you know how you want it to sound in the end. So so I've been I've been mastering a couple of uh, stuff that I've done. Yeah. Um and also sometimes it's a time thing as well because yeah. people you know it's sometimes you don't have an, uh, a lot of time so because i do everything in my studio it's easy for me. They, they get the the mix and master the same day they don't yeah. have to they don't have to book a mastering place you know mastering engineers are busy of course so sure you know, they would they wouldn't maybe get the master maybe a few days later, and sometimes there isn't that time available. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so you know, sometimes it worked well in those cases when they they really needed it quick. That yeah. I'm able to sort of give them a mix and master tracks, and and I think it's not uncommon anymore. Like a lot of mixers do master their own tracks. Um, yeah. And I tend to to master in in the box fully, so I don't I don't uh, come out to to print stuff or. Okay, um, that's interesting. I, I I'll keep keep it in the box. I'm still saying it. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I think I think I need to maybe invest in like better converters and stuff like that to be able to, um, like curate like an art board mastering chain. I think. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not there yet. So that is is that so is is that something that you're evolving then, as you said at the minute, as things stand with the mastering. So when when you are doing the mastering, this really um as you know, as, as someone that's learning and kind of starting to do masters for, for people, uh, myself, um, I know that when people talk to me about LUFS and you know Spotify and the loudness wars. Are you watching all the metering as well, or are you just feeling the music as well at the same time? How, what, what, what's your approach with with, with um, the streaming services? Oh, you definitely have to watch your meters for, for yeah. sure. I think you. Yeah. Um, I think because of the the, the 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 kind of music that I do is it's quite commercial that yeah. I have to I have to make sure that it's it's in line with other commercial tracks. It's not. Yeah. I can't be like, oh, well, this is sounding great to me and and deliver something that's not going to really match the rest. Unfortunately, we have to we we have to be at a certain LUFS level, like you mentioned, or like a, a certain yeah. brightness level and, and things like that. So so I definitely I, ref, I reference a lot of tracks uh, that are out uh, level yeah. wise, you know, balance EQ um yeah i reference all the time i think if any advice for anyone reference 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 yeah. reference <laughs> that's an amazing message <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think we've got the picture <laughs> it's so yeah, good that's so important definitely well, to know it's not it's not to compare yourself it's, it's not um, about comparison yeah. it's just it's just understanding you know the the sort of the standards and and you know people um like a mixer that i really love his work recently is jason joshua and i think he's okay. at as the, the top of his game and he's he's mixing like a lot of great stuff and i think you know looking at how okay well just looking at his track listening to his tracks and yeah. so i reference a lot of his mixes and and it's not to compare myself to him or anything, but it's just this guy is nailing it. So, so I need to, you know, what can I improve to be in, in that in that lane in that zone? Because that's where I want to be. If you don't want to be in there, it's fine as well. If mm. you want, if you want to be, you know, over there, it's fine. Yeah, it's you know that's the beauty of it that you can be anywhere you want. But for me, I want to be where he is. So. Yeah. So I'm referencing his work, and I know the his masters what, what level they're at, yeah. and they're not they're not at minus fourteen. So, yeah. 
I'm not mastering at minus 14. <laughs> That's all <laughs> no. I'll say. Absolutely. So, uh, because I, I kind of, I watch a lot of stuff. I'm sure you've uh, heard of a name, Ian Shepherd, And we, we were talking mm. about Bob Katz earlier. Yeah, and I know yeah. they're, they're very much um, in the world of, um, you know, kind of lower levels and more, which is amazing, like more dynamics. But as you said, mm. like, obviously, like, I know that in the commercial pop world, um, that it's very much like you said, you know, the LUFS is, uh, you know, minus nine, minus eight, I'm guessing maybe around about that sort of Yeah, even minus, level. even even more than that, seven, wow. six. So, but it's the, 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 the tricky thing with that is, is to, what those guys, um, I mean, Jason particularly, is that they are doing those sort of level, but they, they still manage to keep their tracks dynamic. Absolutely, is, yeah, yeah. Is the, is the new is that kind of new way of mixing is that everything is dynamic and it doesn't sound mm. squashed, but it's so loud. That's and, crazy. And that's I think him he does that. Spike does that as well. Mm. And you see, like, how how are they doing this? You know. Yeah. Um, but like you said, I think it's they're learning because they yeah. they they're learning new ways and and they're being pushed maybe you know to things that they don't usually do by artists or by producers and and yeah. i think i'm i'm learning i'm i'm watching their videos i'm i'm reading stuff on online i'm asking people in your on your page how yeah. do you do this because i'm like God, i don't know how to do that why yeah, yeah why is it better to do it that way or that way you know like all those kind of things i think it's it's great because it's it's discussion but it also that makes you a better, better at what you do. So, absolutely, you know, and that's it. I, I think that's that's why the you know the the produce mix fix and conquer page and 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 other groups um, in the audio world are very important because that's great to be able to communicate. Like I was saying to you, that Bobcats replied to my <laughs> commented on oh. my thing. I was like. What? <laughs> you know, that's 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 amazing, and 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 yeah, exactly. Um, and that's that's so great that you were able to to have that that discussion nowadays. It's it's fantastic. Mm, absolutely, and uh, it's just wonderful. And thank you, sir. That's very kind words, man. And um, you know, it's I think what's so great though about our community and many others you know there's so many other good oh, yeah, like yeah. you said good, good communities out there as well and the fact now on the internet you know we we can all support one another and you know amateurs intermediates and pros like yourself you know and obviously the legends like bob Katz, we can just all talk to one another and yeah. communicate and inspire one another because um and as i was saying to steve the other day um the interview and said that who are we to judge who's mm -hmm. the next person who's mm -hmm. going to blow up and, you know, be the next, you know, Bobcats or whoever, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's, yeah. it's so inspiring just to watch the conversations happen, but it's mm -hmm. what I really like about your comment as well is the fact that how you said that, you know, you can ask a question and if you're working on, you know, like a Dave track or a Stormzy track, whoever, London grammar, and you can go, Oh, that's a cool idea. I'll, I'll try that and g give that a go. And, you know, it's like, W w yeah. Would you would you agree like we're forever students of music? We're just constantly oh. evolving and learning. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm I'm spending. I try to. I don't have as much time as I would want, but I'm mm. I'm spending so much time watching videos and watching tutorials. Sometimes I take away some stuff. Sometimes I don't. And if I see that it's not yeah. really what I'm looking for, that I would move on to the next thing. But there's yeah. so much content. So much content that that's oh, really yeah. really useful and sometimes mm. you watch something and it's sort of another question sort of pops up and you're like oh, okay well how do i do this and it's constant constant learning absolutely that's amazing it's so good i think that the fact that you know your academic route has led to where you are it's really inspiring for people to go to uni and you know learn i know that there was, there was a kid that, say kid, is like 21, 22, and he got in contact, uh, sent me a DM, and he said that he was about to, like you said, you were, you, you assisted on Noel Gallagher, he was like about to go into his first ever session after finish, finishing his master's, and he said, I've got, you know, uh, imposter syndrome. What, what I, I, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm really nervous, and I'm really scared. And then it was Tony Mance, who's also joining us on Monday as well, 
uh, for, for the unheard. Um, and it was Tony Mance that posted up on the forum about, you know, imposter syndrome and, you know, that we're all the same and, you know, just treat people how you want to be treated. And then he said by just reading that, he then got encouraged then mm. to work on his first ever proper pro project. And it's just, you, you can't put these things into words. It's just amazing no. just to kind of to see people inspired by one another. For sure. And I think just a quick anecdote, because you mentioned Noah Gallagher, the, oh, that, was, that was actually my first session as a runner at State of the Art Studios with Noah Gallagher. So oh. I was like, okay. And then, <laughs> um, and then he came back a year later and I, was, I wasn't the runner anymore, I was the assistant. Mm. Um, so I did that session as well. But the first day I arrived in the studio, obviously I didn't have a, a big role. I was just, you know, not yeah. touching in, anything, but just making yeah, sure everyone yeah. was happy. But it was with, with him and he turned up with like, I don't know how many, like a, a massive truck with like 50 guitars, 20 amps, wow. pianos, Leslie, organ. It's crazy. You know, and I was like, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> So it was, it was, yeah, nerve wracking. Just seeing like the Stormzy track that you worked on, um, I'll try and remember the name of it. Um, but it's, what, what's the lyrics? Blinded by your grace. And it's yes. just, yeah, and it's just that was Stormzy, like how much that actually meant to him in front mm. of all those people. But then to think that that all started off with you and a few other people with Stormzy in the studio. And then it then transitions and then goes in front of all those people in Glastonbury, thousands mm. of people are singing that song. I mean, that's, you know, that's know. mind blowing. Just I think, that, only, think that, that started with him, Fraser and me. I mean, obviously really? not, me, me not writing, but the yeah, yeah, yeah. just in the room because uh, he wrote it with Fraser and then um, Eminike, who's um, also on the track, came yeah. in. Um, I think it was a bit later on, but yeah. Yeah, so that started as a, you know, as a just us three, but he so he good. felt he always felt so comfortable with with Fraser, and he's got such a strong relationship with with him and me. Then yeah, you know, he was able to do you know things like that. Absolutely, it's very open songs. That was um, just trying to get the name of the track. Yeah, blinded by your grace. Um, yeah, part two. It's just yeah, yeah. such a such a. Powerful song and Kasabian though as well. I know that your sister's on that Bumblebee, but what a yeah. tune! Such a good song as well. It was it was such a great. I I um I will always remember uh, fondly the the sessions with with those guys because it was so much fun. They were so funny. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It was a lot of. It was a. It was hard work because we had a lot of stuff to do and it was on tape. Um. Yeah. So there was you know quite intense. You know, for me, and then at the end of the day, I would print stuff out of the uh, of the tape back into Pro Tools. So a lot of stuff to do for me, but yeah. um, lovely, lovely guys. Again, the the only women in the room. But at the end, oh, at the end, I had uh, they 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 gave me um, uh, a book called I think it's called Mixing Mixing with Your Mind or something like that. Okay, um, okay. Like with like a sign book, and yeah. they, they give the assistant to sign guitar. So, wow. you know, so to, to show you the, you know, their generosity and mm. their, they were so, so funny. And we had like fake mustaches, and yeah, it was, <laughs> it, was it was so much fun. And Tom Love would like that. bring socks to everybody. It was so funny. Like, oh, it was that's... good fun. So, so cool. Um, Manon, anything else to add uh, from today's interview? I, again, thank you so much for having me. And, and I think, um, it, like we said before, it's important to, because I think there are a lot of women doing those jobs, but, may, but maybe they don't get the same attention or the same, yeah. they're not put, uh, for some reason, they're sort of always in the background. And I think it's important that some, get you know that we 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 start to be like okay well we're here because yeah. you know and and um yeah it's great to to be able to to talk to people and and maybe inspire other other women to 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 yeah. get into that Absolutely. that industry and and to keep to keep in it if they're already in it 
and yeah yeah 